cost classification and the behavior. Costs, as you already know, are expenses a business incur in order to produce a product, be it goods or services. So cost estimation might be to analyze profits, establishing a selling price and value inventory. Cost classification, therefore, is the separation of a group of expenses into different categories. Classification is crucial because it aids a business's management to learn of the expenses that are more crucial and require more attention, especially when there is the need to streamline. For example, some costs should be the first to cut down than others, all thanks to classification. Cost units. This is the base point of a product or service to which cost can be estimated. The cost unit should be appropriate to the nature of the business. A car manufacturer's cost unit will be the single car because the business can ascertain its cost based on that product. That of a building construction firm will be a building project or individual standalone phases. The cost unit of an auditing firm will be the clients being audited. Let's now take a look at the types of costs. So we have production and non-production costs. So total cost of a product is the addition of the two. Let's now look at the production cost into details. So also known as the manufacturing costs, these are the expenses incurred to transform raw materials or semi-finished goods into final products. So production costs includes material, labor, factory expense, and overheads. Production costs can be further classified as direct and indirect. With the direct, these are expenses that are directly attributable and identifiable to the product. So the cost of a fabric, thread, and buttons are all direct to the production of an attire. Indirect expenses, on the other hand, are costs that cannot be directly traced to the product, but are necessary for the production of it. So a needle, electricity expense are also indirect to the production of a shirt. So total production cost is the prime cost or the direct cost plus the indirect cost. Let's move on to the non-production costs. So these costs are not required for the production of a business's product. So they are usually for the selling of those products. Examples are administrative expenses, sales, marketing, and delivery expenses. Let's now talk about cost behavior. So cost behavior is the movement of expenses or costs in relation to production levels of a product. So costs are normally expected to rise as production increases, but the manner of the change vary with different levels of production. The behavior of costs can be variable or fixed. So with a variable cost, these are expenses that change with output levels, meaning the more goods or services a business produces or renders, the more of these expenses they incur. So if a fashion designer increases the number of shirts to produce, the amount of fabrics, thread, and buttons, for example, will all increase as well. This will reduce if the designer intends to produce less. So prime or direct costs are all variable. Some indirect and non-production costs are also variable. Fixed costs, on the other hand, are expenses that remain unchanged irrespective of how many or how much a company produces. These costs are normally incurred if a business produces or not, meaning it can never be zero. Examples of such are rent for factory or office buildings, salary of staffs of administrative departments, vehicle insurance, and what have you. Now, some costs can be semi-fixed. Now, semi-fixed costs, also known as semi-variable costs, are a mixture of variable and fixed element. The cost incurred is fixed within an activity range. Once production surpasses that range, costs tend to vary with the level of activity. In reverse, if the output levels drop to the initial range, the variability aspect of the cost is dismissed. The salary of a salesperson can be a semi-fixed cost. Here, he or she earns a fixed amount as salary and a variable amount in the form of commission for every product sold. The salary of a factory supervisor or an HR staff is fixed for, say, 40 hours a week, that is 8 hours a day for 5 working days. 
So he or she will be additionally paid for every hour worked outside the 40 per week. The monthly bill for a cell phone where the user pays a fixed fee as well as a variable fee if he or she exceeds the quota for data or voice calls can also be a semi-fixed cost. Now with a semi-fixed cost, a high and low method is used in segregating the variable from the fixed cost. So let's test our understanding on that. The total cost of a business for the varying output levels are as follows. So at 4,000 units, the total cost is $300,000. At 10,000 units, the total cost is $600,000. So we have to calculate the fixed and variable cost using the high and low method. For solution, the high at 10,000 units, the total cost was $600,000. For the low at 4,000, the total cost was $300,000. When we find the difference, the output will be 6,000, the cost will be $300,000. So the variable cost per unit will be $50. That is the total cost difference divided by the output difference. The total variable cost will be 500,000. That is multiplying the variable cost per unit by the high output. So we choose to use the high output in this scenario. We can also choose to use the low. That means that the fixed cost will be the total cost for the high output less the total variable cost at that level, given 100,000. You are supposed to get the same if you use the lower output side. Another type of cost behavior is the step fixed cost. So a step fixed cost does not change within certain high and low thresholds of activity, but changes when those thresholds are breached. So when the cost changes as a result of a breach in threshold, a new set of high and low activity thresholds will then apply within which the fixed cost will not change. For example, a factory warehouse with a monthly rent of $10,000 having the capacity to store 500,000 units of goods. If a business produces from zero, that is nothing, to the maximum level of 500,000 units, they will suffer only $10,000 as rent. However, when they decide to increase their production to 600,000 units, they will incur an additional expense of $10,000 if they decide to go in for another warehouse with the same capacity. The total cost of rent will now be $20,000. It remains fixed until the production level is to cross 1 million. Okay. An electrical engineering job will also have a fixed cost of labor until the workload requires more hands. Then additional fixed salaried engineers will have to be engaged. Now, management have a choice of either not accepting the increase in activity and by so doing, not incur the additional step fixed cost or accept the increase and incur the additional cost. Now, when activity level declines below the threshold, of the lower output, that is the 500,000 in the instance, the earlier one. Management has the option to terminate the associated step fixed cost. In this instance, they could sell off or rent out the second warehouse if owned or let go if there wouldn't be any cost ramifications. Let's now talk about responsibility center. This is an operational unit or an entity within an organization headed by a manager that is responsible for all the activities and tasks transpiring within that space. These centers have their own goals, their staffs, objectives, policies, and procedures, and financial reports as well. It is important because it enables management to assign specific targets, analyze performance, and easily ascertain efficiency levels. Now, there are four main types of responsibility centers. The first we're going to talk about is the call center. So here, it is a business that incurs only cost. They only add to the expenses of a business by their inclusion. An example is the production department. So a business have to disburse funds for them to manufacture a product. So they have no responsibility to the sale of the product. Administrative units such as the accounting, human resource, and IT departments are also cost centers. Their contribution to profit is indirect. So a manager of such a unit will be taxed to keep their expenses within a certain level in order to lead to profit maximization. The second cost center is the revenue center. Now, a revenue center is a distinct operating unit responsible for generating sales. 
A supermarket may consider the groceries, clothing, household appliance, and office equipment department as revenue centers. Now, a revenue center is evaluated on its ability to generate sales and not the amount of expenses they incur. The downside of this is that they might not be prudent in their spending, which will adversely affect profit levels. They might also engage in unethical acts such as offering unreasonable credits just to increase sales. So a marketing department could be an example of a revenue center. The next center is profits. So a profit center is a business unit responsible for incurring cost and generating revenue or sales as well. The focus is on generating profit, which can be achieved through a combination of increasing revenues and reducing expenses. They are normally stand alone divisions such as branches, retail stores, or a restaurant belonging to a large chain. The last is the investment center. So an investment center is one that is responsible for its own revenues, expenses, and asset investments. So an investment center will usually be a subsidiary company or a division. An investment center can be considered as an extension of the profit center where revenues and expenses are measured. The only difference, however, lie in an investment center being additionally measured on the returns it generates on the assets it invests. That is where we wrap up on this episode's discussion. Thank you very much for staying tuned. Stay blessed.